GoPuff started as a service run by students for students. Now it's a multi-billion dollar business serving over 1,000 cities in a little more than a decade. So how did GoPuff get off the ground? What steps did its founders take to build it into a delivery unicorn? Hey, I'm Josh. Join me as I break down GoPuff and share how it all started, where the early growth came from, what the future holds, and what three lessons you can learn from its rapid growth. Lesson one, see solutions, not problems. GoPuff's story starts in 2011 when its founders, Rafael Elishiev and Yakir Gola, met in a Business 101 class at Philadelphia's Drexel University. Thanks to similar backgrounds, the two instantly became friends and then roommates. Both were children of immigrants and had worked in their family business. Russian-born Elishiev first worked at his dad's sandwich shop and later a banquet hall his dad has bought. Similarly, Gola, the son of an Israeli immigrant, worked at his dad's cash for gold store. Gola was lucky enough to have a car in college. But because none of his friends had cars, he ended up doing the late night runs to grab snacks when the munchies hit. After another late night run with Ali Shayev tagging along, they thought there had to be a better way. They figured if people are already getting takeout delivered, why couldn't they do the same with convenience goods? Excited by the idea, they shared it with their friends and family, but none of them thought it made sense. They all said they'd rather go to a convenience store than order from an app. But the two decided to push on with the idea. They figured that there were tons of college students like them that would much rather get their late night snacks delivered than make the trip to the store themselves. They targeted the pot and tobacco smokers looking for hookahs, vaporizers, grinders, and rolling papers. They even had eye drops and a selection of snacks available with delivery ending at 4.20 a.m. Lesson two, creativity is key. With proof that their idea works, the two founders faced several challenges. These included financing, developing the app, acquiring users, buying stock, and even the actual deliveries. To fund GoPuff, the two took every opportunity they could. While looking for furniture, a family friend gave them what was left in their old office building. They kept what they needed and sold the rest on Craigslist for a total of $60,000. This was enough for them to buy some inventory, rent a warehouse, and pay the Ukrainian programmers they hired to build the app. To get students to try their service, the duo convinced professors to let them pitch the app to students before classes. They also handed out branded bottle openers, lighters, and magnets. Since they didn't have much money, Elishayev and Gola had to convince suppliers to let them buy stock on credit. This was tough considering they were a new business with no credit history. One trick they used to do this was to exaggerate the size of the customer base. They also couldn't afford drivers. So for the first six months, they ran all deliveries themselves. They also handed all other aspects of the business like orders, inventory, marketing, bookkeeping, and customer service. During this time, they worked for 16 hours at a time, seven days a week. Sometimes they'd even have to leave class to make a delivery. But this hard work paid off. By 2014, they had an impressive 25,000 customers and 25 drivers. Lesson three, be adaptable. That year, they decided to move away from focusing on stoners and students. Instead, they turned themselves into an on-demand convenience store. As part of this pivot, they moved away from their raunchy marketing strategy. This included half-naked women on their website and ads like, who's getting lays tonight? Or delivery when the bra is off, but the munchies are on. As a result, their average customer's age was boosted from 18 to 22 to 25 to 34. This helped them cater to a wider range of people. The following year, while still seniors, they expanded to campuses in Boston, Washington DC, and Austin. This was tough because they were bootstrapping the company and only had enough cash for the bare minimum. They even resorted to sleeping in their warehouses instead of shelling out for hotel rooms to save cash. This dedication to their business worked. Within that year, they completed a staggering 500,000 orders in nine cities. When trying to open a new location, three factors affect the launch. They need to rent a warehouse, hire drivers, and get the area's suppliers on board. 
If one of these pieces isn't there, the whole thing falls apart. Even then, not all cities work out. When they tried to expand to New York in 2015, they only lasted two years because of high property prices and other good late night options. Still, these three lessons helped GoPuff expand to over 1,000 cities, serviced by hundreds of micro-fulfillment centers. It makes money by satisfying what it calls instant needs. With an average delivery time of 25 minutes, it charges a flat delivery rate of $2, that it waves on orders over $49, but the delivery fees go to the drivers. Instead, GoPuff gets its money by heavily marking up its products, and more recently, by selling better placement on its app. Thanks partly to the pandemic, the result was $1 billion of revenue in 2021, three times the amount made in 2020. Still, the company isn't profitable. While it claims it's profitable in all markets where it's been operating for at least 18 months, a quarter of its centers aren't making any profit. But Elishayev and Gola credit this to their high spending to manage GoPuff's hypergrowth. A lot is spent on automation, routing software, and other technology to help pack and deliver orders more efficiently. According to them, if they weren't investing in growth, they'd be profitable right away. But GoPuff isn't the only delivery service that's not making a profit. Uber Eats, DoorDash, and Grubhub aren't turning a profit either, and none of them have the added costs of operating warehouses. Another part of the spending is on acquisitions. These include liquor chains, delivery services to help its international expansion, and a software company. They funded all this spending with the $3.4 billion it's raised over nine rounds. With its latest $1 billion funding round of July 2021, valued it at a massive $15 billion. Looking to the future, GoPuff wants to continue expansion into the UK and Europe. According to reports, it's in talks to acquire Berlin-based delivery service Flink to take on the big German delivery service Gorillaz. Turkey's Getir is another big European player that it'll have to take on, along with smaller ones like Wheezy, Jiffy, and Deliveroo. It is also adding more products to its lineup, including healthy snacks, beauty and baby categories, and curated mystery boxes. Finally, GoPuff is planning to open a store in San Francisco. Here, shoppers will use digital terminals to place their orders. Workers then pick those orders from a product storage area that also services online orders and brings them out to the customer. GoPuff started because two college juniors thought there should be an easier way to get late night snacks and smoking supplies. <laughs> Little did they know that this idea would have morphed into a $15 billion delivery unicorn, offering everything from diapers to beer just over 10 years later. And that's it for another business breakdown. Which business should we break down next? Let us know in the comments. Until next time, bye.